In this program, I meet Dan Belzerian, who is one of the world's biggest social media celebrities. From a normal childhood, to his time in the military, to the insanity that has followed him on his journey to becoming one of the most notorious people in the world. Many people love him, and many people hate him. He likes weapons, he has thousands of them, from guns, bazooka, to own tanks. He also loved money and poker, and one day he won over 10 million dollars at a poker game. But he also had three heart attacks, had been close to die many times, and had a lot of stress. But who is this guy? Is everything a fake? Is it a setup? Hope you're enjoying this program with Dan Balserian. Warm, warm welcome, Dan Balserion, to the podcast Framgångspodden. Thank you, brother. Nice to have you here. How are you? Good. A little tired, but good. One thing, I'm pretty impressed with you, I must say. Like, you are training a lot. But one thing, you are, you're always going around with shorts. And you have, like, pretty big legs. <laughs> and that is no, not, not so many guys that have big biceps that also have big legs. Yeah. Yeah, I think people skip legs a lot, but you know, it's hard, man, when you're traveling. I think that's like the eating and the training. It's it's difficult. Like here, food is like 40 minutes late. You know, it's hard to find a good gym. Like especially in the EU, it's like most gyms here are really not like comprehensive. Versus Vegas, you got fucking 10 gyms on every block, so it's a little harder in Europe. But yeah, but I heard that you have your own chef traveling around with you in the world. Yeah. Well, they shut her out of the kitchen here. So I was like, I brought the chef, but I couldn't really fucking use her. So like when we get houses, it's good. But hotels is a little rough. Right. But yeah. what do you, can you tell me about your like training and eat program? What do you, uh, what do you eat and how much do you train? Like uh, I heard that yesterday that your chef was calling to the restaurant here, Kasai, and said that, Okay, Dan is coming, but no minus for him, no Solomon for him, yeah, uh, and a lot of other stuff. And also, he don't eat uh, desserts, so we 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 uh, must have some fruits. I I know the owners there, so he said like he was running like the last minutes to run and get some fruits too. Oh, really? Yeah, I um, yeah, I don't really do sugars. I don't do like refined uh, food, like any processed foods are out. I try and stay away from. I do more fats now than I did before, but I kind of like put them later in the day. So my diet in the beginning will be more protein and carbs, and then later in the day it'll be more protein and fat. So I kind of like like post workout and then um, and pre workout is carbs, and then after that it's pretty much just protein and fat. So that's my diet. I'm like pretty strict with it. I think diet's a big piece of it, you know. Like people think that, oh, you could just train, 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 but there's really like an, you know, a fucking limited amount of time that you can train or else you're going to be in a state of overtraining. So like when you're 20, you can get away with doing more shit, but when you're older, you can just fucking only train so many times, you know, you can only lift so much, you can only do so much cardio. So your, your diet's not fucking fine tuned. Like you see it, like you see it, like with the UFC, like there'll be guys like, like country Nelson, for instance, this guy's got a big old fucking gut trained six hours a day, you know? And so it's really just, it's diet, man. Like diet's a big piece. And do you take any supplements to like enhance your health? Uh, I mean, I take testosterone, uh, which is pretty fucking strong. So <laughs> I just do HRT. It's like hormone replacement therapy from a doc. And uh, Okay, so you take testosterone every day? Yeah, yeah, I shoot it every day. In the, in the ass or? Straight in the leg. In the leg. Oh, that's why oh. your legs are like horse <laughs> legs because they get like the, the, the first testosterone. I don't think it's like spots, like site injection stuff works, but yeah, I shoot legs every day. Okay. And then you take CBD? CBD is just like help to sleep. Yeah. That's not really like much of a, you know, training thing, but sleep's important, man. Like sleep's yeah, a yeah, big yeah. fucking thing. Like people don't realize like how important sleep is. Like I think the people that get it, take it for granted. And the people that don't get it, um, usually just kind of like walk around feeling like shit a lot and they just don't know why so it's kind of like you just get used to whatever right so if you're just you haven't slept for fucking you know years and you just don't really know like what you're missing and these guys that are getting great sleep they just kind of like think well well fucking everybody gets great sleep so yeah i talked to a scientist for a while ago and, and he said that is it only one thing you should take care of only one thing you should do about like training 
eat and sleep. So prioritize your sleep. Yeah. And that's where you recover. I mean, you can train all you want, but if you're not fucking sleeping, then what's the fuck, you know, what's the fucking point, right? Like if you can't, like you break down the muscles and like, you know, during deep sleep is when you rebuild. So if you don't get that, then, you know, you can break them down all you want. It's not going to help you. And, and uh, one other thing I know that you are doing that uh, I'm also doing and, and I, I like, yeah, I love it and it changes a lot. Uh, I'll take like cold showers, but you have to take it to the next level. So you take like cold bath every yeah. day. Yeah, two, three times a day. Two, three times a day. Yeah. That's insane. Why? Why? And when, when did you stop with that? Um, fuck, man. I started like two years ago, um, something like that. But it's it's just helpful, man. Like it helps your circulatory system, your immune system. It's just... It's just good. Like you, you feel it. Like you get a dopamine hit. Like fucking the equivalent of doing cocaine. I mean, it's like pretty important, man. Like it does a lot, and people don't realize. Like also another thing is people are addicted to comfort. So I think when you do things that make you uncomfortable, it kind of like makes it to where you appreciate your homeostasis more. You know, like I think you need to suffer every day. Like even if it's just a little bit. Yeah, I think it's also good for the inflammation in your body. Yeah, it's good for that. Good for recovery. I mean, it's a fucking ton of benefits, man. I don't really do it so much for the recovery stuff. I do it more for the like cognitive function, the relaxation, the circulation, the immune system, like all that shit. So that's kind of like my primary. But but like now we have like two kind of people. The guy that you see in social media, the, the thing I was thinking about you was like, yeah, you train a lot for obvious, but also you're partying a lot a late night a lot you drink a lot you take cocaine a lot <laughs> uh you think like lsd and maybe ecstasy or heroin i don't know but a lot of shit and 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 now we're taken to like a monk that are are uh, uh you know go to sleep uh take some vitamins supplements well, uh, I actually don't the, party like, that much. Like I was doing breathing techniques, uh, yeah. uh, cold bath. That, that's is this y yin and yang. But I actually like I don't do too many drugs anymore. I'm doing like some GHB mushrooms, shit like that. But I don't really do. I never really was big into coke, man. Coke is like to me the most overrated drug. It's like makes it so you can't sleep good, you can't fuck good, you can't eat. It's like all the shit that I like to do kind of fucks it up. So yeah been more of like a weed guy. People, people, people like the up or the down, you know, more of a down. I had uh, read, read your book before this interview and I can say I read, yeah, a lot of books, but this book was like, uh, I think one of the six book I ever read. Yeah. It was so many stories and uh, you have met so many people and your life has been, you about, yeah, many times you have been very close to, to die. So, um, how was it to write this book? It was tough, man. It was like two years. Like it was a tough process. It was probably honestly like of all the things I've done, it was probably one of the hardest things. Like writing a book as not a reader, not a writer, you know, going through that whole fucking process, doing all the editing myself. Like it was a lot. I mean, and it was fucking shitty work. Like I would much rather be suffering in the gym than suffering like behind a laptop, like trying to figure out what I want to say. Cause there's also a limited amount of like, like good hours because after you reach a certain point, you actually become counterproductive. So I would spend time like working and I would actually like fucking do more harm than good, you know? So I'd have to go back and then fix that. Cause I'd be, you know, on the fucking 10th, 11th, 12th hour or whatever. And just, yeah, not be sharp. So yeah, it was a tough process, man. That was, you know, fucking something I would not recommend. I would recommend yeah. doing like the ghostwriter route for sure. Mm. I write uh, one book uh, as well, and I, I actually hate it. Yeah, it sucks. It was, uh, I also have dyslexia, yeah, so I can't write, I can't read. <laughs> How <laughs> was that reading in like a different language with dyslexia? I mean, that had to be tough, right? Um, no, I think, it's, uh, I, think it's, uh, I think it was okay. I think it was okay. I have, I have a problem to write. I, when, I, when I write an email, it's, it's like in my brain has something, you know, it's a, my brain is broke somewhere. So uh, when I write the email, I think everything looks good. But when I send it away and I read it after, 
uh, it's like yeah mistakes everywhere yeah but but yeah it was it was an interesting book it was an interesting book and and um, uh, some stuff was I, I was thinking about some stuff and um, was thinking about uh, i i don't have a father my father was going away when i was three um, and uh, I don't have the best relationship to my mother as well, so I was on a foster care and stuff. But you have a pretty strange relationship as well to your father. Uh, and at, at one point in the book, uh, your father actually was going to Yale, and you was pretty young. Yeah, yeah, when I was 11. So Yeah, you were 11 years, and can, can you tell me about this episode? It's just shitty, man. You know, I think the, I honestly think the worst part of it was that everybody knew and I didn't because it was like front page news. And, you know, he kept telling me like, I'm not going, I'm not going because he thought he was going to win his appeal. And so I think that was probably the hardest part was like the day that he went to jail is the day that he told me he was going to jail and everybody else had known for like a year. And so having to go into school, knowing he was going to jail and then knowing that I had to face all the kids and kind of like deal with that shit was i think the hardest part of it and uh, how did this affect you i mean it was a shitty time i think i've gone through worse like i think being thrown in jail my senior year and like not graduating um feeling like a fucking failure that was that was for me i think worse and then definitely getting kicked out of seal training was worse I've had some like pretty low points for sure. I mean, I, I've had some high points and then I've had a lot of fucking lows, but I think, I don't know, man, those hard times, like if you don't have hard shit that you go through when you're younger, it's kind of like, you don't really get that same drive. Like I feel like people that go on to like achieve a ton, either it's because of, you know, failures or insecurities, or there's like something driving those people further than, you know, the average person. Right. The average person is kind of like, I don't know. I mean, the easier you have it, the, like, you know, fucking example I use, like the high school quarterback, like he's, he had it easy. He got all the pussy. He didn't have to work for much. And then a lot of times these motherfuckers are like pumping gas. You know what I mean? But the guy that was like a nerd in high school, sometimes these guys go off and fucking, you know, work their ass off, invent something, become a tech guy, get a bunch of fucking money. And then, and then they get all the pussy. You know what I mean? So it's kind of like, I don't know, man, pay now or pay later. It's like eventually you got to fucking put in the work. And so if you kind of have it super easy, like, I mean, a lot of these trust fund kids, for instance, they have it super easy, never have to fucking work for anything and they never accomplish anything, you know? So I don't know. I think hardships are good. I think at the time you think they're shitty, but then later on in life, you realize like some of those shitty things were actually like the best things that happened to you, you know? So. Mm. And what was the uh, toughest part when you were a kid? What, was it that you were bullying or was it that you were having a strange relationship to your father or what was it? I think having to listen to people's shit, you know, like people telling me what the fuck to do. Like all these people talk about like, oh, I wish I was a kid again. Like I wish I could go back. Like, I, I didn't want to go back. Like, I wouldn't want to be a fucking kid again. I didn't like people telling me what to do all the time. So I think that was the hardest part about being a kid is having to fucking, you know, just listen to everybody's bullshit. Like okay. I've never wanted to follow rules and never wanted people to tell me what to fucking do. So it's like, I don't know. I think that was probably the worst part of being a kid. Mm. Bullying was probably a close second, you know. You wrote this in, the, uh, in, in your book. Uh, but I'm honest. From a young age, I wanted hot girls and I wanted to be rich so I wouldn't have to listen to anybody's bullshit. I wanted <laughs> to get tons of pussy and I wanted total of freedom. Yeah. When did you set up this goal? When did you thought per, about this? Pretty young, man. Like I saw my five years. Oh, uh, probably older than five. Yeah, it was, I mean, I saw my neighbor. You know, he had the hot chicks, he had the fast cars, he had all the cool shit. And my dad had money, but he didn't spend it the same way. You know, so I always looked at my neighbor. It's like, you know, this guy's got all the hot girls, he's got the fast cars, the diamond watch, like that's just what I wanted. You know, and I think I think it's because I didn't have it. You know. But were you born rich? Um, when I was born, I wasn't rich. Like, I think my dad got rich maybe when I was like seven or eight, maybe something like that. Six, seven or eight. You know, like initially we were actually like me and my brother were living in the same fucking like we had to share a bedroom and, you know, relatively small house and whatever. And so, 
Yeah, I don't I don't remember exactly when he got rich. I just remember him talking about I'm going to build this fucking house and it's going to have a basketball court and you know all this shit and I would tell kids at school and they always thought I was lying. And the fucking thing took like seven, eight years to build. But when he finally built it, then it was like, you know, it's kind of, I think that was like the, like one of the first times when I really realized that I wanted to have money because I saw how people looked at me differently once I was living in that house, you know, like you just got more respect, like girls are more interested in you, like all this shit. And the only thing that had changed was the house. Right. So I saw like kind of the power of of that and the effect that it had on other people. So it was like a cumulative effect, but that was, you know, definitely one of the big, like, you know, tipping points was how people reacted to me. But did you get a lot of money from your father? No, I didn't even get it till I was like 30 fucking something. You know, I'd already bought a jet. I'd, you know, made a ton of money. So it was like, fuck man. It was, I think I want to say it was like a little over a million bucks. It was like literally like, Mm. I was like, that didn't even pay for fucking half the jet fuel that year. You know what I mean? I was like, nothing. And people act like I had this fucking huge trust. Yeah, 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 like, yeah. it was big at one point, but it was a bunch of, like, symmetric stock, and it ended up fucking, you know, not being worth much by the time I got it, so. I understand. Yeah. And we will jump into the poker for that. That's, that's pretty interesting. And, and um, go to step forward. But before the poker, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the Navy SEALs. And that is also, uh, you know, it's very crazy. I've done like a similar not navy seals but in what, what we have in sweden and uh, one of my things that i i felt when i was uh, a mine clearance diver uh, i felt like i can do everything uh, if you let me breathe if yeah. you let me breathe i can run like a mile i can do whatever you want but let me breathe but yeah into the water and i know that you wrote that in your book too tell me a little bit about this I was always comfortable in the water, but yeah, man, it's funny. Oxygen is like a lot of things, you know, you don't miss it till you don't have it, you know? So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it was tough. I mean, it was fucking, it was shitty. It was one of the hardest things I ever fucking did for sure. Um, but I just wanted it really bad. So I think that's what kept me going. Cause I did like 510 fucking days. I did a lot. It's supposed to be a six month course, you know, plus your in doc and all that shit. But like, fuck man, I get, I kept getting rolled back and doing it again, doing it again. And I don't you have know. an injury stress fracture. You have like first time. broken legs and stuff. So. Yeah. First time I had, two, I had bilateral stress fractures. So they were actually going to kick me out of the fucking Navy. So I was going to get a medical discharge, but it took them so goddamn long that I ended up putting in a request to go back. And then it was like, that whole thing was a fucking kind of a catastrophe because I'm at a limited duty command. I'm about to be discharged from the military fucking for a medical disability. And I'm putting in a request shit to go to Navy SEAL training. <laughs> so my officer brought me in and he's like, you fucking idiot. He's like, I'm not approving this. And I had to like go over his head. It was a whole thing. It was, yeah, but they, they approved it. And I went back, you know, so. And uh, like I have some, you know, uh, really crazy memories. Uh, one one of them were like we was running a lot, and we will, you know, swim and run and swim. But then we also had a, a section that we uh, uh, should eat a lot. You know, drink like ten liters of water, and you can't drink at ten one liters time? of water. Yeah, at one time, yeah. and you can't drink it. So everybody was throwing up, and and you have like all kind of crazy like drink milk with this uh, uh, vinegar and some crazy shit would drink like a liter from that so everybody was drawing up so that was like pushing us down uh, a lot but what is your memories from the from the navy seals do you have any like this was one of the toughest or this one was or this was crazy or this one i feel really bad yeah, there's definitely some standout things. I remember, fuck, I remember waking up and looking at my alarm clock and it was 3.30 in the morning and I just knew I was going to get hypothermia and I knew I had to fucking go shave and I knew I had to do this and I only slept like fucking two or three hours and it was just, it was one of those times when you're just like, man, if I had a nine to five job and I could just fucking sleep in and go take a hot shower and put on warm clothes and not get hypothermia today and fucking eat a goddamn donut yeah. and drink some fucking coffee. Like that would be so amazing. Like just the average life seems so appealing because it was so shitty. 
you know, and then I remember, I think it was the third day. It was on Wednesday of hell week. You start off on Sunday and you go till Friday and you get, um, they give you one hour of sleep on Wednesday. And, uh, I remember waking up after, I don't think I slept much, man. They give you an hour, but you go in there, you're wet, you're sandy, you're fucking cold. And I don't know. I just, I remember I got enough sleep to where when I woke up, I was fucking like, I don't know, man. It was like waking up in the worst nightmare of all. You know, it's like you're already fucking cold. Like, you know, when you wake up in the morning, the last motherfucking thing you want to do is jump into a cold body of water, you know, like, and especially if you wake up cold. Like even when you wake up, you know, and you're kind of like fucking warm, you still don't want to do that shit. But when you wake up and you've been fucking cold and you're still cold, the idea of going to jumping in the fucking ocean and having to lay there for fucking no. 10 or 20 minutes, <laughs> it's just, it's like, like I said, it's like waking up in a fucking nightmare. And you know, it's not like, it doesn't end after that. You've got two, two more fucking days. You're not going to sleep. It's, that was a, that was a tough point. I had to do three seven mile ocean swell. It's a five and a half mile nautical swim, which is about seven miles on the land. And I had to do a third seven mile ocean swim um, in a three week period because my swim buddy hyped out on the last one. So I volunteered to do another one. And uh, I remember that was, it was almost like five hours. We we're in the 55 degree water fucking swimming and I don't know. I mean, you, you can't see shit below you. You know there's fucking sharks there. It's fucking dark. It's cold. <laughs> You're fucking tired. Uh, you know, it's just... I mean, it's one thing to do something for 10 minutes, 20 minutes. When you do something for five fucking hours... Like, most people have never worked out for five hours in their life. Let alone be cold the entire fucking time. And wet and this and that. And hungry and thirsty and all this shit. And you're chafed and you're fucking gut injuries and whatever. It's just, I don't know. There's a lot of times that I remember um, being like, what the fuck am I doing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And from this to the poker, um, why did you stop with the poker? Well, my brother taught me how to play when I was in college. And it was kind of, I just got out of the military. And it was like one of the few things that they gave me that same adrenaline. Um, and... Uh, I don't know, man. I liked it. Like, it was fun. Like, the idea of winning and, or possibly losing money and having to fucking read somebody and, you know, looking down at two fucking aces or looking down or you just made a fucking straight. You know, just the, the exhilaration, the excitement of knowing that you're probably going to win a hand or when you fucking make a big bluff and you're like, I don't want this motherfucker to call. Don't call. Don't call. Don't call. You know, it's just, I don't know. It's hard to, it's hard to explain. Like, gambling is a special rush, but most people haven't gambled against other people. Like it's one thing to gamble against the house. It's like, put your fucking money down. You got one decision. It's either hit or fucking stay, you know, in, in blackjack or in Baccarat, you don't even really have any fucking decisions. You just bet and hope that you win. Whereas in poker, it's like you have a decision every fucking, you know, every, every single street, right? You have a decision pre-flop, you have a decision on the flop, you have a decision on the turn on the river. It's like, you know, and you got to figure out like how you're going to play your hand. Are you going to check? Are you going to check raise? Are you going to bet? Are you going to, you know, just fucking slow play this thing? Like what, you know, you have to calculate odds the whole time. You're trying to figure out like, there's just so much going on. And you add that to the fact that you could win or lose a huge amount of money at any given moment. It's fucking, it's addicting, you know? Yeah. And in, in the beginning, you also like sold some of your weapons. It's like two pistols and, yeah, two pistols uh, and a shotgun oh i went bro shotgun i was so like like 75 dollar uh 750 bucks uh yeah yeah you got a pretty bucks. good memory man <laughs> <laughs> for for reading the book one time that's pretty good yeah i um i just fuck man i i was broke broke like i wasn't just like not had money i was like i had a fucking loan out of my car i owed other people money like i was like i was in bad shape parents weren't going to give me shit my brother wasn't going to loan me any more money like nobody was going to help me out and so this is kind of like my last fucking you know shot and so i i yeah i sold the guns and that was painful because i love guns and uh yeah i went to this fucking gambling boat for like five and a half days and just played every single fucking day it was like 16 hours go back to the hotel sleep come back fucking play again and uh, I, I made like around ten thousand dollars, and me and this Asian kid, we bought one-way tickets to Vegas, kind of like the movie Rounders, and it was just like, "Fuck it, we're just gonna, 
we didn't have a fucking flight back, so we would have like lost our money. We weren't even be able to get home. So it's kind of like, yeah, that was a that was one of the moments where man, it was you know, I mean, there was like some skill involved, but I also got lucky because I was playing above my bankroll, so I easily could have gone broke. We started off at like two dollar, five dollars, so it was a five hundred dollar buy-in. When I went to Vegas, I was like pretty quickly playing like a two thousand dollar buy-in, so. At five buy-ins, not a lot. You know, you get get unlucky. You could play everything right, just get unlucky, and you could lose. So, um, yeah, fucking part of part of being successful in poker is you know making the right calls, doing the right things, but then also like being responsible, having a bankroll, like not playing above your means, like being able to sustain the game, like sustain, like just being able to stay in. So, cause I mean, that's the thing about poker. If you play long enough and you're a favorite, you're just going to fucking win. Just like the house, you know, they're going to get your money. Like if you play fucking Baccarat, they're going to get your money. It's a matter of time. So that's why they want you to play more hours. They're not as interested in how big you're betting as how long you're playing. Cause the longer you play, the more they're going to fucking, you know, the less variance they have and the more they're like guaranteed to win. Right. Well, it's, you know, poker is the same thing. Like as long as you play right, like you're gonna win in the long run, but you have to be able to sustain it. Yeah, but but, but uh, how much uh, did you work with this strategic of of this? Like, um, yeah, if you're a UFC fighter, it's very important who you will uh, fight. Yeah, like I'm a wrestler. That's a very good wrestler. Or no, that's a stand-up. Yeah, I can wrestle him. Or how? Yeah. Do you? And for you as well, uh, it's not good at. Uh, you sitting with like 10 of the best pros in the world and yeah. then you have like 100 hours to play with them that's not good and how that, did you that was always what i opponents? said that was that was like a big thing that i, I think people you know just gloss over in poker is like it's actually more important who you're playing against than how good you're playing you're actually better off to play like decent and play against bad players than you are to play amazing and play against the best players because your edge against those best players are going to be mm. it's going to be mm. small You know, versus a bad player, you could have a fucking massive edge. Like there was guys that literally could not win. Like I played against guys that like fucking almost never, ever, ever booked a win. So you just don't get that, you know, playing against good players. Like those guys are going to have a small edge or you're going to have a small edge and there's going to be variance and they're going to play aggressive. You know, it's the whole thing, right? Mm -hmm. And so that was, I realized that early on, man. Like it was just fucking for me, it was, I wanted to get into a fucking berry patch. Like I wanted to play against the fucking rich, bad players. And that was always my goal. It wasn't to like have people think I was good. I didn't want to fucking play against the best. I didn't want to be on TV. Like none of that. Okay. I just want to win the motherfucking money. That's yeah. all I want to do. And that's what I did. And what is the most money you have win over like, yeah, one tournament or one game or one day or what do you say? The most I ever won in one day, I th was like 10.8 million, and then I won. 10.8 million dollars. Yeah, I had 12.8 or 12.7 or 12.8 was one, but that was like over the course of a couple games, so it wasn't really one game. But yeah, in one night, 10.8, 10.8 or 10.7. I mix them up. There's like there was a 12.7 or a 12.8 and a 10.8 or a 10.7. That's a million dollar there. A million dollar there is hard to remember well uh, but, it, well it's the hundred well because I, i was tipping a lot i tipped like three hundred thousand dollars to these fucking dealers like in one night I, like there was a time i tipped three hundred thousand dollars so i actually won i think on the 10 8 night i won i think 11 million but i tipped like two or three hundred thousand dollars oh so okay but but and how was that feeling of winning or tipping yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, winning the winning it was numb Like when I won, I didn't like, I didn't feel any, I'd like conditioned myself so much to just like not be super happy or not be super upset when I would win and lose. And so I had just kind of like muted my emotions. And so when I would win or lose, I didn't really have much of a spike. Like there wasn't that like big, there was a little bit like that. It's definitely like when you win big pots, but I also like just knew that just because I was winning at one point in the night didn't mean I was going to end as a fucking winner. So I would not celebrate. Like I was a big, big advocate of like, you do not fucking count your money while you're sitting at the table. Like you don't fucking count your money until that check has been fucking cashed. Like I could have won a big amount of money, but until that money hit my fucking account, I did not celebrate. 
You know, and even then I didn't allow myself to celebrate that much because I could have fucking, you know, I could go and lose it the next week, you know? So it was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. it was one of those things that until I actually stopped playing poker, I almost couldn't really like celebrate. And that was one of the things that I think when I look back, I think that's one of my biggest regrets is that I didn't enjoy climbing the mountain as much. I was just so focused on getting to the top that I didn't ever stop and smell the fucking roses. And I think that's something that a lot of entrepreneurs probably um, fall victim to as well. But it was definitely true for me because it was such a weird career, you know, like any other job, you make money, you can celebrate, you have a big win, you get a promotion, whatever. But poker is one of the few things other than like stock trading where you can go into work, do everything right and then fucking lose money. So it's like you almost never really know what your net worth is. You never really know how much money you have because you could just fucking get super unlucky the next day or have a bad day or whatever the fuck ever. And so I think the only times I really celebrated was when I'd like go home I'd smoke a joint I'd sit back and I just like force myself to like enjoy the moment and be like, damn, like you could buy a lot of shit with this money. You know what I'm saying? Like, and I think in college when I would win and I would actually go buy a motorcycle or I would buy a, you know, fucking pistol or I would buy something nice. I actually felt more from those victories than I did later on when I was winning a ton of money. Cause it was almost like unspendable. You know, there's like a point when like I had so much money that there was just like nothing more I could buy. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> So I think that took some of the joy out of it. And I think when I decided to really quit gambling was when I realized that when I won, I didn't really get that happy. And when I lost, I was pissed. So it was like one of these things where I'm just like, this is like almost a guaranteed recipe for me being miserable. Yeah. And you also got really much stress. You were depressed and uh, you actually get three heart attacks as well. That wasn't so much related to the poker, but I had two. I had two. And it was it was back to back. So I had one and then like while I was in the hospital that night I had the second one. Yeah, maybe it was actually also to the drugs, maybe more. That was actually yeah. I was taking testosterone and I was taking Ecopoi. And Ecopoi increases your red blood cell production. So I had like really high hematocrit and hemoglobin. And at the time, I didn't even fucking realize that. But a lot of guys now are starting to get wise to that. When they get on HRT, they start bloodletting. They give blood every Mm -hmm. whatever, three months, four months. And so they try and like lower their hematocrit and hemoglobin levels because having high testosterone will jack that up. And I was also... um, I was skiing in Aspen or I was in Telluride or I was somewhere high altitude. And I hadn't slept in like two days. I was also dehydrated. And the more dehydrated you are, the thicker your blood is. So I had high hematocrit, high hemoglobin. I had just come from fucking high altitude, just gotten off the plane. I was doing coke. I'd done Viagra. I was fucking banging a stripper. It was like this perfect storm of all these fucking stupid decisions. Shit. And yeah, man, shit. That's exactly right. <laughs> Land of you right Jesus. in the goddamn hospital. So. Jesus. Yeah, that was that was actually one of the last times I did coke. I've done it maybe like three times since then, and that was when I was twenty six or twenty seven. Was it also the last time you did Viagra? No, no. no. I, I I stopped Viagra for a while, but there was times when I definitely like. I mean, dude, I banged nine chicks in a day. You know, so it's like you don't do that without help. I talked to some guy yesterday that said that they are producing honey, but some kind of honey, but it works as Viagra. Well, they've got Viagra in honey too. So they've got different methods. I always preferred Cialis because it gave me like a long runway. Uh, I read something in the Femi magazine. They wrote like, uh, he objectifies women on a mainstream platform, normalizing women as a background rather than as actual human beings. In other words, you make women according to them. Props. What are your thoughts about this? I mean, I think the women benefited a lot more than me. Like, I've made more girls famous than fucking anybody else I can think of. So it's like, I don't know. I mean, they went in eyes open. Like, I never lied to them. See, I think a lot of guys lie to girls. They promise them this, promise them that. Like, I didn't promise them shit. And I was, like, super honest about everything. So I think the women probably got more from me than I got from them. And what, what kind of states uh, are you at now in your life? Are you uh, dating like 50, 100 girls or, or do you like... No, uh, I'm, I've been like just chilling more this year. I've been working more. Um, yeah. Kind of like in a break, I've been dating one chick and 
I mean, hooking up with other girls here and there, but it's been, you know, a little bit, you know, just more focused on work and hanging with my friends. And what is most important, fame vs. money? Fame or money? Yeah. Oh, man, it depends on what your goals are. Like, if your goal is to get laid, fame is a sledgehammer. There's nothing stronger. Um, but if your goal is everything else, then money is more important, I think. Because um, it's freedom, it's, you know, it's access, it's the ability to do all this stuff. Um, and you can use money, it's a strong tool, you know. Fame is a pain in the ass, dude. Like, if you're not a sex addict, like, it's really, like, I would say a net negative. You know, because it's just, fuck, man, you have no privacy. You can't do a lot of the shit that you want to do. Like, How is it for you to walk around in L.A.? You can't. I, heard I mean, L.A. is easier, honestly, of all the cities. L.A. is probably one of the easier ones because there's a lot of celebrities and people like more know how to act there. Um, but I can't just go walk around unless, I mean, I can. I'm just, I just know I'm going to have to end up taking a bunch of photos and having fucking conversations with people and shit like that. So, you know, sometimes you just want to be left the fuck alone. You know, sometimes you just want to like go have a fucking beer with your buddy. You want to go have a fucking burger. You want to go fucking, you know, mm -hmm. hang with your friends. You want to go out with your right, fucking right, family right. or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Like you don't want people fucking with you, mm -hmm. but you can't turn it off, you know? Okay. Okay. And we must jump in and talk about Ignite because you also have a side that is growing a lot. How did this ID come up and, and uh, can you tell us what you're doing? A part of it was like a byproduct of the fame. I was like, well, fuck, man. If I'm going to be this inconvenienced and I'm going to have to do all this shit all the time, then, you know, I fucking, you know, I want to be able to have something to show for it. You know, if I got to take fucking pictures in the parking lot in five years, they're going to like have built something. And so I just felt like it was time to like focus on something else. And I was kind of over the social media shit, but I felt like I should do something with it. So Ignite just seemed like you know, a good segue from like doing it to get laid versus like doing it for a purpose. And you also have uh, like nicotine pouchers that helps people uh, get away with the smoke. Yeah. I mean, you can't smoke everywhere, right? But people want that nicotine fix. So I think the pouches are good for that. I think vapes are a great fucking alternative to cigarettes. I mean, cigarettes are the worst shit ever. I mean, it's like you're not only affecting yourself but everybody else around you i mean i see these fucking families and the dad and mom are smoking cigarettes in the car and the kids are fucking breathing that shit in they gotta do it in the house and it's just like it's fucking brutal man like i wouldn't you know i just i don't even think yeah. it should be legal honestly to smoke around no, kids no, no. versus vaping like you're only affecting yourself mm -hmm. right and it's the nicotine it's not like i like i think most of the you know cancer causing agents are the carcinogens the fucking smoke you know just all the byproducts of the combustion of you know plant matter whatever it is you know your body is not designed to take smoke into the lungs versus nicotine is kind of like i don't know man i've read studies where it's beneficial i've read studies that say that it's you know not so beneficial but cigarettes are unequivocally bad for you they've got like almost no redeeming qualities and so to me it's super crazy when cigarettes are legal in some places yeah. and and vapes are not that's fucking crazy to me because vapes are unequivocally the healthy alternative to smoking cigarettes Mm. And uh, what kind of product do you have? Are you going to launch? What are your goal with Ignite? Um, I mean, my goal was, you know, a big part of it was to get people to stop fucking smoking cigarettes. You know, when we went into the, you know, vape space. I mean, I just saw that as an opportunity. I've been a mm. huge advocate against smoking. I mean, ever since my fucking girlfriend's dad died from cancer, I had to watch this guy go from like 180 pounds to 135 pounds when he died. And, um, I just, I don't know, man. All the cigarettes just fucking stink. They've always bothered me. Like, I just can't stand the shit. Um, and so, to me, I saw, you know, a, a good way to, like, get people off cigarettes. And to me, it seemed like a, you know, pretty good business. If people were going to be vaping, I wanted them to be vaping my shit. Yeah, that's good. I also, I can say I hate that. I, I hate that people smoke because it's so man, so much bad stuff about it. And my my grandma died from smoking and get a lot of lung cancer and stuff. So, uh, and uh, yeah, we didn't know so much on the, on the seventies, but now we know. Yeah. So and uh, it's terrible that you need to see young kids and they still think it's cool to smoke. 
Yeah, I mean, I think the trend is dying. You know, it definitely seems like it's shifting more towards vaping, and I think people are getting away from cigarettes. I mean, vaping is just such a good alternative, right? Like, it still gives you the nicotine, which is what these people are addicted to. It gives them the oral fixation. They get the whole fucking thing. It tastes better. They don't stink. It's like, I don't know. I think it's a no-brainer. I mean, I, I just I look at people that smoke cigarettes, and I just look at them like they must not be very intelligent. Mm. And what are you going to do further? Yeah, I think the thing I'm working on right now is a site where it's basically going to like teach guys kind of like Sigma. How, what's that? Yeah. Sigma. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's going to like teach guys how to be guys. You know, I feel like the, this generation has kind of like lost that. And you look at, you know, two out of every three guys under 30 have not had sex in the last year. I mean, it's like, it's really bad. Like in the 50s, like everybody's kind of getting like a decent amount of pussy. They're in decent shape. And now the disparity is just massive. It's like guys are either in super good shape or they're fucking terribly out of shape. You know, guys are getting a ton of girls. They're getting no girls. There's not really like any middle ground, you know? So I think that's, you know, one of the things I wanted to focus on. And how is it to be in Sweden? And and, and what is the next step? I've only been here for like 24 hours, so it's hard to really say. Or maybe I've been here for like 36, but it feels pretty quick. Um... We're going to the club today. Should be good. Um, went biking the other day. I would say the one thing that I've noticed about this place, it kind of reminds me of Amsterdam to where you can take the boats around. You got the bikes. Like everything's kind of like surrounded by water. Buildings are a little older. And then it kind of reminded me of Iceland too as far as the sun. I mean, the fucking sun is like up for 20 hours a day, you know, which is unusual. You know, you don't really get that in the U.S. So it's kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Thank you very much for visiting Danville, Syria. Yeah, good times, man.